Hello and welcome to On the Record, a debate-style television talk show where Bahamians will find the balance through an open debate you've been looking for. Welcome to our 100th episode of On the Record. Proverbs 27, 5 and 6 says, Better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Any member of the clergy or leader of a religious flock is almost duty-bound to speak to the shortcomings, sinful nature and immorality of a congregation and nation. We've come to expect certain levels of open rebuke from the pulpit. And then there is the ministry of the church. Good Christian charity, arms to the poor, suffering the children to come unto him, and so on. Even the gospel of Christ speaks to a savior who publicly rebuked established religion, but dedicated his life to helping mankind. There's almost contradiction in these roles, best describing my guest tonight and our discussion. A well-known cleric of 42 years in the Anglican Diocese who has established himself as not only a priest among priests, but who is no stranger to controversy and headline-grabbing occasions. As he prepares to officially exit his role as a parish priest tonight, we get his views on religious and secular issues, as well as talk about the legacy he now leaves behind. Beloved, steadfast, immovable, Father I. Ranfully Brown, the priest turned public figure. It's all on the record tonight. I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. Our discussion begins on the other side of this break. On the Record is brought to you by Alive, the nation's newest and best LTE network. Good to be alive. That Alive has, um, it's allowed me to uh, save a little bit of money um, on my mobile phone service. Um, the, the reception is always great and I especially like the uh, roaming services that the company provides. Um, I've traveled all the way to Southeast Asia um, with my Alive mobile service. Um, I've been to Italy with it. I've made calls in those countries and the service was always clear, crisp, and I never had any sort of problem whatsoever. So I was really impressed with that. My name is Lazar DiLorenzo Charlton and I believe in best. Hi, I'm here to tell you about the fastest way to purchase the vehicle you want right from home. With SPT Japan, we import used cars from Japan straight to you. Car ownership doesn't have to be hard. Go to svtjapan.com and sign up for free. Search for the car you want, place your order, and make a payment using any one of our convenient payment options. Once you pay the duty and tax through our in-house broker, we will clear the vehicle and even deliver it straight to your home. Sounds too easy? Well, shouldn't it be? In a matter of months, Reverend Father Ivan Ranfully Brown will retire as rector of the historic St. Agnes Anglican Church, the fifth Bahamian and second son of the parish. He became the 12th rector of the largest parish in the diocese 12 years ago. He is my guest tonight and for the next hour here on the record. Father Brown, welcome. Good to have you on the record. Thank you very much. I, you know, I always have to give a disclaimer when I have... Uh, certain people on the show, certain topics. I'm a member of your church, um, and I have to let people know that. That uh, and a lot of what we're going to talk about is some some of my uh, personal knowledge um, uh, as being a member of the church. But I want to start really um, and put this discussion into context. In June of 1977, you were ordered a deacon. Did you envision 42 years ago that you would ascend to 
such a place of prominence within the diocese, within the church, and even the country? No, I, I, I never did. Um, I was more concerned as to if I would make it 10 years, if I would make it 20 years, make it 25 years. Uh, but my cons major concern was how best would I be able as a priest to serve the people. I've always had that in the back of my head, you are to serve the people. You're not to master over the people, but to serve the people. And um, when I got ordained and I was made social outreach chaplain, for the Central Deanery. My job was to coordinate all the social outreach programs um, for the church in, churches in the Central New Providence area. You often speak about the influence of your mother, grandmother, the figures of the, in the church at the time when you were a boy in Grandstown, uh, growing up, going to the church. Was it an expectation that you would become a priest, that you would join the order? Were you was that an expectation of you, or was that something? Yes, that yes. I always had it formulated in my mind I wanted to be a priest. And um, coming under the influence of the late Canon Milton Cooper, he encouraged me. Uh, we were at a, a mass, a requiem mass, um, mm, in the early 60s. I was serving with him, um, and at the altar, he said to me, I want you to become a priest. And that lingered with me all the time. And it was, and it was always the challenging voice to me um, as I grew. I want you to become a priest. And um, in those days, Canon Cooper was the, the man who really influenced vocations. Most of the prominent Bahamians um, in the priesthood were influenced by Canon Cooper. And I believe I just got the, the tail drop of him. People will you always say, when it, particularly when it comes to the priesthood and ministry, that some are called and some are chosen. How would you describe yourself? Oh, I'm called. I'm called. And probably that's why I behave the way I behave, because I do not allow um, exterior, external influences to make decisions for me. Um, I, when I'm challenged, I have to examine myself as to who I am and whose I am before I make a decision. And my decision may not be a popular one because I know in whom I believe, and I'm persuaded that I'm who he wants me to be. You mentioned decisions being popular and unpopular. How difficult is that when you have to face into a situation that it's probably unpopular with a congregation, even unpopular with a nation, and even, say, a political directorate at the time? Before I make a decision, I pray about it and I meditate about it, that whatever decision I make would be the right decision in according to God's call to me. And when I have come to that conclusion, the gates of hell will not prevail. You will mention, well, you know, Father, we can't do this, or you can't say that, or you shouldn't, or, and you have, you know, uh, influential people, whether they be in the congregation or in politics, I'm sure would have say, would say to you from time to time, oh, you know, that's not the position to take, or we need you on board with, with this or that. I make my decision on what I have considered, and realizing that my actions may not be what people want, but maybe it's what people need. And why is that important? To be the beacon in a community, and in order to be the beacon in the community, you have to make sure that it is the right decision you ought, ought to make. You, you hear me use that word quite mm -hmm. a bit. All the time. Ought to work. And so um, I, 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 I don't like to be 
in the popular decision. I like to be in the right decision. And that has got me in a lot of problems. Do you think more religious leaders and even our leaders should take that stance, not necessarily in the popular? I think, I think it, they need to. There is need for it in this country today for people um, to realize who you are and whose you are and cause your decision to make to, to be the one that you ought to make as a man called by God. Now, you cannot mind what the people say. You have to live with you. And you have to live with your conscience. And sometimes your conscience don't make you very popular. But your conscience allows you to cause people to stop and to think as to what they ought to be a part of. Do you find people will come, I know in my own experience, sometimes I'll hear you say things at the pulpit, and in that moment, I may not agree, but then I'll sit afterwards and think and think, you know, maybe Father is right, or maybe I need to look at this differently. Do, you find, will people, do people often come back and say that to you, or they will just carry on, um, having agreed in some way, shape, or form, or listened and paid attention to what you've said? I don't have very much reactions like that. Um, but I always remember what Archdeacon William Edward Thompson mm -hmm. said to me, and he must have said it to many others. The gospel caused you to get upset. The gospel upsets you. Explain. Because if, if you say something and it causes someone to think, and they find out that they don't necessarily agree. There must, there must be an inner being that causes them not to be able to think. And they, if they think, it is contrary to what is said. Now, you are um, a son of St. Agnes. I want to talk a little bit about uh, what makes St. Agnes this producer of priests? It has produced more priests than any other church in the parish. Um, what is it that is about this church that has produced men like yourself and so many other? Leadership. Others? The leadership of the church. The leadership of the church draws and it encourages as well as it encourages by example, what you see, it was, a, it was a, amazing how we listened to Milton Cooper. It's amazing how we listened to William Thompson. Mind you, he never said um, everything that you want to hear, <laughs> but it caused you to think. And we're not thinking anymore. I was about to ask you, do we... Where are the, the Milton Coopers and the uh, William Thompsons um, of your era? And, uh, where are they today? Are they there and, and silent, or do they not exist anymore? And I don't just mean in the Anglican Church. I mean in the country, because these were men who, who like yourself, were known n around the country, not just in the church. Where are those men and women today? I'm afraid there's no more. Um, because... We have politicized the church. Yeah. When I say politicized the church, there are groupings in the church who feel that they ought to be this and ought to be that and ought to be the other. They're trying to take the leadership from the priest. And that's where the problem is coming in. It's happening in other churches where they're trying to take the vision of God for themselves. And that's where the problem comes in. What do you mean, take the vision of God for themselves? Because the troublemakers in the church don't pray. And so they have no vision of God. They don't pray. All they ever do is talk with people. All they ever do is to plan against people, plan against programs. And, and they never, ever a part of the vision. When you, when I come into a church, 
I have to plan. What do I want to accomplish? To the glory of God. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not to my popularity. The glory of God. And then there, there is always that element that feels that um, he not going to do this and he not going to do that. Now, if I go into church and I ask for money to do this and that, and they say, no, keep your money. I make my own. I raise my own. If it is of God, you cannot destroy it. If it is of God, you cannot overthrow it. And I have had occasions where I asked for money and they wouldn't give me the money. I said, keep your money. I go raise money, hundreds and thousands of dollars to the glory of God. Because it ain't me. It can't be me. And so I don't let those things worry me. They get upset because I don't get upset. But then you look at, at, at other churches where it seems that uh, people are in the business of church to make money. I mean, you, uh, and that's a whole, I can, so you, you talk about not giving money, but on the other side, people are saying, you know, every time they go to church, they're asking for something, they want something. And then you look at, at what, you know, how some men and women are living, who are leading churches. And, and it seems to be all about the money and what you can bring to the church. Sad enough, that is the case. But I leave them to God. Uh, God is the final judge. And um, all I want to do is to, to serve the people of God as best I can. Um, I drive a truck because a truck is more useful to me in ministry than an air-conditioned car. A lady comes to me and says, Father, I need a bed. I say, okay. I go to the furniture store to my friends and I say, I need a bed. They say, well, Father, the truck is not here. Um, I say, I got a truck. <laughs> Where do you want me to pull up? <laughs> i tell you a true story. An old lady, she's now dead called me. Say, Father Brown, my granddaughter just broke the door off the fridge. I say, I'm coming. I go there. The door is on the floor. So I call my assistant priest, who was then Father Denrick Rule. I said, come here, buddy, let's go. He said, where are we going? I said, let's go. Jump in my truck. Went. No, 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 I didn't have a truck here. That's what, this is what caused me to get the truck. We jumped in the car and we went to an import export place. And I said to them, I need me a refrigerator. He said, Okay, Father, you can have one. So we turned around and we went outside. So then Rick said to me, well, how we can carry the fridge? So there was a truck parked out there outside the store. I went in and I said, whose truck is that out there? They said to me, it is our truck. I said, the Lord has need of it. <laughs> we got the refrigerator, put it on the back of the truck drove to the lady's house. So I said to him, measure the door, see if this could get through the door. He said, what can I measure the I said, take off your belt, measure the door, finger to finger. And he measured the door. And he said, and he, he put the measure on the, the refrigerator. It couldn't get in. Door too small. So I said to him, measure the top and the bottom. The bottom was wider than the top. So I said, we can slide it into the bottom. Lay the fridge down, slide it into the bottom. Just enough to get it in the house. 
upright the door, upright the fridge. And I said, ma'am, a minute ago you didn't have a fridge. Now you have a fridge. And we left. And while driving, Denrick said to me, all of this is ministry? I say, this is just the beginning of ministry for you. This is what it is to be. And that has been my life all the time. Well, that's a good place for us to take our first break. We have a lot more to talk about. Stay with us. We're going to have more on the record right after this. Are you afraid to swipe your card and you don't like to carry cash? If so, you need checks. Executive printers can make checks for all your needs. They have laser checks, personal checks, Checks, continuous checks, and more. All checks have up to 15 security features, so you know you'll be protected. You can even customize your checks. Come and see one of our experts today, or log on to epbahamas.com for more info. This portion of On the Record is brought to you by Generali Insurance Company Limited. And welcome back as Parish Priest Brown's pragmatic approach to ministry was carried out in three very prominent parishes. Father Brown's grave practical expression to his vocation has led to a chapel seat to Her Majesty's Prison, Director of Social Services for the New Providence Central Deanery and Diocesan Youth Officer. These engagements were the vehicles through which he contributed to the social development of our young nation. Father I. Ranfilly Brown, priest turned public figure. He is my guest tonight. Sir, you have always made your convictions and your positions well known. You say things and take positions publicly that make many other, that many other clergy dare not touch. Why? I don't know. Um, like I said um, earlier that you, you the priest has to come to grips with his calling. And the call of God to each makes him or her an individual called by God. There are times when the priest has to come together with his other fellow priests but there are times when the priest has to be the prophet and spokesman of the Lord. Yes. Not compromising the word of God for filthy lucre and political positions. And if that is to be the case, then one is led into certain areas of life, spheres of life. And he has to be prepared to take whatever that comes, the consequence that comes. People expect a priest to be gentle, almost Christ-like in their approach. You, however, deliver some harsh rebuke sometimes. Yeah, but that was Christ. You're, you're going around here talking about gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He was a rough fella when it needed to be rough. All right? You think, you can imagine Jesus going in the temple and saying, get out of here, get out of here, huh? There were some times he had to be rough. But you know, Peter's my favorite fella. Why? Oh, he's, he's rough. He didn't take no foolishness. You can, you can be of God and stand up for righteousness and support your ministry by the various programs that you do. 
And you have to do that. What do you feel are some of the greatest threats to the Bahamas today? The, the compromise of the word of God. The compromise of the word of God. There's too much compromise in this country. And we need to find ourselves again and be what God wants us to be. That's all. When you say compromise, are people, do you find people are compromising because of the external influences? Or what, what's the reason you think for the compromise? One, one is personal. Uh, one is person, personal um, um, greed um, for um, the center of, 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 of being popular. The, 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 I, I think that's it. Um, people come and they look forward for this and look forward for the next thing and forget that they are to be the prophet, to be the Amos. Um, and you know something I find out that we don't preach from the prophets anymore, you know. We don't preach about Amos and Hosea and them anymore. Where the, the prophet went into the town and, and he, 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 he stood up for righteousness. They don't do it anymore. Everybody wants to see how, how, they, how good they can preach um, and, and say nothing. And they, they, everyone wants to see how popular they become as a result of preaching and not concerned about the calling. You got to be, you got to be conscious of your calling all the time. That makes you unpopular. But wasn't it so with the prophets? When they spoke the oracles of God, they even tried to kill him. And so I think there's a need for the Christian church beginning with the Christian council to go back to the old landmark. Why do you name the Christian council? Because they're the leadership of the church do in think, this country. Are they, do you think they're ineffective? If they were? Are they ineffective? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And they're my friends. Why? How? Why do you think so? How has that been allowed to happen? How have we gotten to that point? Because people want popular positions in this country to say, I am this and I am that. And the next thing, you know, I am this, I am that. So what? And you're not answering your call. Because all of us are called. You here in this television station, have a calling. And so God is expecting you to do the best you can to cause whatever you are doing to be the best. A lot of the criticisms you will hear about the Christian Council and even the church, it seems that you cherry pick the issues to which you speak on. Like there are only certain issues um, that you will hear from the Christian Council or even certain members of the clergy. Yet every day there seems to be uh, things that, that, you know, that, that are, are being done against the society. We are in peril in many instances, but there are only certain issues will be hear from our religious leaders on. The Christian Council and other of our churches are not speaking. Righteousness exalts a nation. And sin is a reproach. We seem to, if I, 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 if I support a political party, that ain't mean you can get away. Wrong is wrong. All right? There are some of us who get involved in these political um, things in the country and fail to stand up for God within their midst. You think anybody can tell me what to preach? Mm -mm. 
I close my eye on them. And we have to get back, get back to the old landmark in this country where sin is a reproach. All right? Now, you can allow them to determine what is sin. And that's what we're having in the country where our masters determine what is sin. I have heard you get up sometime and speak to your politics. I support, I am. Um, but then we'll also speak out against a policy or an individual from the pulpit. Yes, you're supposed to. You're supposed to. You're supposed to. So you think priests should declare I support a particular party? Not necessarily. Okay. Not necessarily. So why why do you do it? Why is it important? Well, I, 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 I play in with them. Man. Okay. I play right. in with them. Man. <laughs> I'm a happy fellow, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't need money to be happy. I'm a happy fellow. I have answered the call of God, and he has convinced me that he will take care of me. Why aren't more of, of, of why aren't we getting more of that rebuke and speaking? I hear you all the time speak out against individuals and even policies. You'll say it's wrong or it shouldn't happen or our leaders are such and such. Um, and sometimes when that happens, people accuse you of being political. Yeah, they, they accuse the prophets of being political. But that's, that's human nature. Anytime I say something to you that you don't particularly like, you don't favor me anymore. It takes a real individual who understands what it is to serve God, who will know what to say and know what to react to. I hear you all the time speak to order and tradition. That's a, a, a very important thing to get. The world is changing very rapidly. Um, how are you, how do you balance speaking to, to order tradition um, when you have, you know, a congregation uh, that's living in a world that's rapidly changing, where, uh, you know, the, the norms of society even in, in some cases are changing. How do you, this seems almost sometimes a contradiction. And I know, and I say that because I know that you are one who believes in, in, in youth development and, and propagation of young people, but yet you still speak to, to holding on to, to the traditions and, and order. Because you have to leave something in place and cause the younger generation to realize that they are the leaven of the lump. And they are to be, be the new influence as to what God calls us to be in the world. Now, I grew up in the Boys Brigade. I, I was a drill sergeant in the boys' brigade. So if you can teach drill, you have to have discipline. Mm -hmm. All right? Um, and that's my basic influence in life. And I teach the little ones the, the fact that you have to have some order in your life. You have a, you, I, I know this from personal experience, you have a passion for young people, for the youth, and for youth development. Yeah, I'm concerned about the future. And why is that so? I mean, I see it in, in almost everything that you do to the point where we even, you know, I could say this, we even have on, at certain times where young people lead the entire service. Yeah. Why is that such a passion for yours? And why is it so important at a time like now? Because you have to teach them what they ought to know, what they ought to do, all right? Um, you know, and... and I have found some areas of our church where they, they lack teaching. They, are, they, they, they lack the knowledge of what it is to be Anglican. All right? Sometimes you got other denominations come as St. Agnes and, and do better than St. Agnes people. All right? You see them make the sign of the cross. You see them come to the Senate Isle and genuflect. And our own people who are there every day. So we have to 
grasp the opportunities we have to leave a legacy. Who's going to carry this church forward if they don't know what they carry? And that's my concern. One of the things that, that I know of that you are opposed to women serving in the church. Um, why and how do you still manage to hold that position? Well, the, the, well, I, I, I sort of easing up on the thing, but the priesthood of the church represents the fatherhood of God. And by that you mean? How do women represent the fatherhood? How can women represent the fatherhood? But I finish with that, man. I finish with that now. It's a position you let go. You can see that. I ain't let go. I ain't concede. I ain't let go. I just quiet. You just quiet on yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. All right. But sir. my position has always been that the priesthood of the church represents the fatherhood of God in the world. So don't mix up your gender. Interesting position. All right, sir. If you are enjoying our discussion, stay tuned. Our show continues right on the other side of this break. My name is Lazar DiLorenzo Charlton and I am the Public Relations Manager at Sandals Royal Payment. My live service is uh, fantastic. I really like the pricing structure that Alive has. Um, it's allowed me to uh, save a little bit of money um, on my mobile phone service. Um, the, the reception is always great and I especially like the uh, roaming services that the company provides. Um, I've traveled all the way to Southeast Asia um, with my Alive mobile service. Um, I've been to Italy with it. I've made calls in those countries and the service was always clear, crisp, and I never had any sort of problem whatsoever. So I was really impressed with that. My name is Lazar DiLorenzo Charlton and I believe in best. Hi, I'm here to tell you about the fastest way to purchase the vehicle you want right from home. With SPT Japan, we import used cars from Japan straight to you. Car ownership doesn't have to be hard. Go to svtjapan.com and sign up for free. Search for the car you want, place your order, and make a payment using any one of our convenient payment options. Once you pay the duty and tax through our in-house broker, we will clear the vehicle and even deliver it straight to your home. Sounds too easy? Well, shouldn't it be? My guest tonight is Reverend Father Ranfully Brown, who is moving steadily to his retirement from the priesthood. So, which of your accomplishments are you most proud of? When I was at Christ the King, I established a, a home for homeless boys. Since I've left Christ the King, it has grown and fortified in a wonderful outreach ministry of the church. When I was concerned about how best Christ the King could serve the people of Ridgeland Park, I went to the Ministry of Social Services and I asked them, how best can the church help to do for our people? And they said to me, they have no difficulty in housing females, but they have difficulty in housing boys. So we started with 10 boys in a house we had purchased from somebody and uh, 
and it grew and it grew and it grew. Um, we challenged the government to help us and they did. And um, uh, I don't know what's happening just now. Mm -hmm. But the wonderful and touching thing about it is that when I go places and someone says to me, Hi, Father Brown, how are you doing? I say, I'm fine. He said, you don't remember me? I say, no. I'm from Colby House. I said, what? And that's a blessing for me. Have you accomplished the things you set out to do um, when you started 42 years ago? Most of them. You know, when I started out, I, I, I spent two years, three years in, in Nassau. I'm working out of Nassau. Um, and then I went to Bimini. Mm -hmm. And there was a great challenge down there. Um, I was able to build a house, a rectory, um, complete the um, structure of the then church that was built by Canon Strawn, but he never completed everything that needed to be done. And to landscape the entire property of the church. Um, then I came to Nassau and there was a great challenge there at Christ the King. You know, Christ the King had a hip roof. There's a long church with two roofs. Mm -hmm. So in 1999, I took the roof off, the entire, and put a one straight roof, dug up the floor, tiled it, and put it in the stained glass windows. Um, and it's a brand new church again. Uh, and air conditioning. Uh, that's basically it. I purchased all the properties around the church so that if the church in the future needed to do any expansion, the property was ours. I have to ask you, what is it like having to shepherd over a St. Agnes Parish, largest parish, um, a lot of influential members, um, not an easy church. And you came in at a very difficult time. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, serving priest, the late Father Patrick Johnson, had died suddenly. Prior to that, um, Archdeacon William Thompson had been murdered. Um, and so the church really was in a, in a, in a spiral, a downward spiral, and, and I, I, as a member, I, I know what it was like. You came in at a very difficult time, and what a, to deal with a church that a lot of people call a difficult church. Mm -hmm. Difficult, but you have to focus. You cannot be distracted. You must have a vision. Everybody's not going to agree with the vision because many are disconnected. And just press on. Now, if you continue to fool with me, I can deal with you. All right? And I had to been doing that. There have been many efforts to discredit me. But if it is of God, it will stand. You have had some difficult times, sir. 2008, you faced an assault charge over an incident involving a 14-year-old at a church picnic. How did that affect you and your ministry? I saw it as a means of discipline. Um, people do not know the story and have not attempted to know the story, but just to say that Brown did this, all right? And I would not tell the story because I have to be pastor as well, all right? Um, and we went to court. And there was not one moment when I felt as though that I would not be vindicated. But some things you gotta go through. And a lot of people say, uh, the priest going to court, the priest getting locked up and stuff like that. Yes, nothing wrong with the priest getting locked up. Ain't nothing wrong with the priest going to court. But make sure he goes to court for the right thing. 
Do you feel that there were other motives behind that? To go to court? For the whole incident? No, no, I think there were um, teenagers who have no home training. And, and that's the problem with the church, you know, the priest got to be there to keep discipline and the young people they ain't got no home training. When the parents themselves need training, you know? But that's a part of the calling. And uh, they were just being influenced by other parties that were there. And the incident happened. But I don't want to go into that story. Sure. Just, yeah. but February. They, uh, 2016, Bishop Lace Boyd removes you from as an archdeacon. It follows comments published in the church bulletin in open rebuke to then Prime Minister Perry Christie for showing grave, what you call grave disrespect at a funeral of a prominent businessman. It had to do with a lot of time uh, to bring remark to the re funeral. At the funeral, do you regret the stance that you took? Oh no, oh no, oh no. I stood, and if I did not stand, then. I would have been deemed irresponsible. Um, but I, because of the stand I, I took, I was <laughs> deemed what? Disrespectful. All right. Um, I'm ready to go into that suspension thing, not yet. But I can deal with that eventually. Um, but it was a means whereby Others thought that they would have got rid of me. I easy so. You, the suspension happened, you returned to church with the demotion. How, how were you able to, to push through that? Because I do not serve the church for promotion, nor position. I serve a risen savior, all right? And Whatever was behind or whoever was behind it, God will deal with them, including the bishop. That obviously has created some tension between you and the bishop. Oh, no, I ain't got no tension with nobody. No? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. He took his position, which he has a right to do, and I'm, I am happier every day. All right, I don't disrespect him, um, but he has a lot to answer to God for. You are a strong proponent of doing what is right. To many people, your actions were indefensible. What do you, how do you respond to them? What can I say? I have done the same. I haven't done anything wrong. That's all I can say. Uh, and what I said earlier, you have to stand on the promise. You have to stand for something. You have to stand on your conviction. All right? I don't want to comment on that, you know? Uh, one fella can get up and talk in 20, 25 minutes and think it's all right. Ah, man. Mm -mm. Do you ever worry that these controversies overshadow the good work that you've done? Oh, or no. My good work stands by itself. And if the contra controversial stuff um, had any clout, I would have been gone. Listen, the priest ain't called to go around the hands class and walking around the place with the gown on, you know. That ain't priesthood. The priest has to stand for something, especially for the young people, so the young people can look up. Man, we used to look up to Willie Thompson. We used to look up to, to Milton Cooper. Because they stood for something. It is difficult to work in the church today, but you got to stand for something. Well, that's a good point for us to take our final break. You're watching On the Record. Our final segment is right after this break.
Hello and welcome to On the Record, a debate-style television talk show where Bahamians will find the balanced, true and open debate they've been looking for. And the icon goes to On the Record. On the Record was born out of a desire to do something different. What we do every day helps our country, it helps our society, it helps to shape the views and opinions. What is that? What is that? What is more dangerous than corruption? Gentlemen, we've got to move very quickly. Let's wrap up. It's all on the record. I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. Our discussion begins on the other side of this break. First Chronicles 28.20 says, David also said to Solomon and son, Be strong and courageous and do the work. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. After 42 years in the priesthood, Father Ranfilly Brown is preparing to admit office. The priest turned public figure is in many ways known for his outspoken style. He leads the largest congregation in the Anglican Diocese in St. Agnes Anglican Church in Grantstown. Father Brown also serves as chairman of the Bahamas Companion Relationship Committee between the Diocese of the Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos Islands and the Diocese of Southeast Florida, as well as he is a member of the Board of Governors of the Codrington College and president of the Provincial Clergy Conference of the province of the West Indies. Father, you have a lot going on. Um, mm. Now, I have to ask, how does a boy from Grand's town, from very humble beginnings, rise to such a place of prominence? You know, that is my gratitude to God. Um, I don't know how. Um, I'm from Meeting Street, opposite Bethel, Trudali. Mm -hmm. And I remember sometimes and when my elastic in the waist, you all know how them kind of pants no more. Elastic in the waist was stretched. I had to fold it to the side and put a closed pin. And then I went to St. Agnes at the age of seven started on the altar and every opportunity that was available I took advantage of it. I was in every organization in St. Agnes that a male could, could be a part of. And then I told you about the, the mm -hmm. experience with Father Cooper and William Thompson came and encouraged and off I went. And um, a poor mother, father just died, and uh, she was sending one little five dollars in the envelope to Barbados to you. But I was lucky; I had Bishop Gomez in Barbados. Bishop Gomez is my court brother, mm. and he and his dear wife made sure I was okay while they came back. The only deacon in the church at the time, and so they sent me everywhere. I, I had the exposure of Long Key, Crooked Island, um, um, in Acklands, and um, uh, uh, well, Acklands, and then um, Andrews, Mangrove Key, um, and Bishop Eldon would take me everywhere with him. I never said no for the exposure. 
And then uh, it happened. God has been good to me, and that's why I could be a testimony to anybody. And from my experience with God, ain't nobody going to uproot that. Nobody. Is there any work that you leave unfinished? Anything that you would have wanted to complete that you haven't? Um, some work around St. Agnes. Um, but eventually it will be done. Uh, I, 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 I left Christ the King satisfied that I completed a lot of work there. Um, and like I say to every young clergy person who comes, leave your mark. Don't let nobody discourage you. Leave your mark. Interesting. Many great priests that you would have studied under, many of them we've referenced here, Bishop Michael Eldon, Archdeacon William Thompson, Canon Milton Cooper, left legacies that live on even today. What do you think yours will be? I know you know. <laughs> I know. I, I don't know. What do you think people will say about you? I, I started to say and will continue to say about you. He stood for righteousness. He stood for righteousness. He, has, he was concerned for the youth. I'm looking at that photograph there. You see all that young chaps. And um, he never backed down. I know sometimes I'm traveling with the bishop, and the bishop say, oh, don't fool with that. I say, oh, yes, I can deal with this. Why, is, why are those moments so important to you? Because it tells me that I have been faithful to the voice of God and not man. And many times, I may do things that I feel is of my conviction. And people try to con, um, cause problem, confuse me, because I have not done it that way. And I believe every way I have done anything in this church has been for the betterment of God's people. I'm trying to finish off this public shower. Can't get it finished off. Because some people don't understand the people of the street that come to me and they wear the richest fragrance that no store could ever sell. And you have to, you have to deal with them, serve them want something to eat, want something. I know a chap walks into town every day and one day he was just, just lying there next to Duncan Donut. And I said, boy, what you doing out here? Uh, ain't nothing, Father. I said, come, let's go. Because they can beat you if you don't come. And I had to lift him up and get him on his feet and bring him all, all the way over the hill the grass down <laughs> when I was about to leave him. He said, but what I can eat? You don't give me nothing to eat? <laughs> so, then I have another young lady of the community. And every time she comes to me, I gotta, I gotta buy this and buy that for her, buy that. And, and then one, I hadn't seen her for a while, and then I pulled up to, to the office. There she comes. Even office staff knows her now. And I said, how you know I hear? I said, I see the truck. And when I see the truck, I come in. And you have to give her something. I give her $2, she say. Now, what I can do with this $2? I give her $5. She said, that's better. So I give her $10 one day. He said, now you know I love you, right? <laughs> So, They're the kinds of things thanks, that yeah. I find myself doing. It keeps me alive and alert.
There are a lot of activities that will mark your official departure. There's an event on the 3rd, a jazz under the stars. There's a um, afternoon of elegance on the 26th of May. These are all events. And then your final mass on Sunday, uh, June 2nd um, at, at the church. At no, the, the, sorry, the, 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 the final service will be on the 28th of July. Of July. Right, at 4 p.m. But the, um, the, the June, you say? Yes. That June, is the June highlight of the parish. Okay. Uh, Once you have held your final mass, then what? What's next? I go home. I, I'm going to be busy up to, to September. Uh, when I leave on the 28th, um, I'm off to New Orleans, a large convention. You know I'm a large man. I know, sir. You're yeah. a big large man. I'm yes, a large you. man. I, mm -hmm. I got to go to a convention, and then when I come from there, some girls carry me on a cruise. <laughs> And uh, when I come from there, another a place wants me there for three weeks. And um, I cool. I cool. I could preach, man. I, you know, you still I have I still some years left. So we, I, we will still continue to see you in, in here. Oh, yeah. I, my membership will be as an Agnes. Don't care what them other fella, fellas say. They can't stop me. Um, and, uh, and then I can just I can play it cool, boy. Enjoy. Enjoy. So, uh, as we are at the end of the show, we wish you, first of all, thank you for coming on and having this conversation. I yes. appreciate it. I'm sure the audience would have appreciated and gotten some insight uh, into you. Um, and certainly the, the, the work and the life's work you've given to the church and the country. And I want to thank you for that, uh, what you have given not just to the diocese and to the Anglican church, but to the Bahamas. I think um, history will um, be very kind to you. Um, for what you have done for the country. And, and again, we thank you for that and wish you all thank the best. You. Thank you. you know, thank retirement you. doesn't mean the end. It just oh, means no, another no, phase. No, I'm just, <laughs> just young and, and dynamic and going. We look, yeah. forward, we look forward to many more. Thank yes. you very much. Sir. Thank you, sir. And also the honor, this is our 100th, 100th show. So you have the honor of being my, uh, a guest on so the 100th that's what milestone. I'm about. Yes, yeah, so that's what I'm a memorable about. show. Thank you yes, very thank much. Thank you for having me. So yeah, good to be here. Thank you again. So All we right. hope that you have enjoyed our show tonight to our audience, and special thanks to Rand Fully Brown for uh, being our guest this evening, to my producer technical staff. This is our 100th episode. We just want to pause for a moment and say thank you to you for your continued support in this venture. Once again, I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. We'll see you next time.